right, how's everybody today? You good? You feeling good? Elbow your neighbor, ask him if they're ready for the word. Ask him that in Napa. Are you guys ready out in Napa for the word? How about East Bay and CMF Prison Campus live stream? Let's welcome everybody outside the room today. We love you. We're glad you're with us. Your life is going to be changed because the Holy Spirit's going to move in our time together. And uh, today's going to be a unique day. Uh, we're going to do a hybrid sermon. You're going to see what that looks like in a minute. A uh, couple reasons. There was a real grace last night to communicate this message, real anointing on it. So we're going to show you uh, a, a big chunk of the sermon from last night. And it's going to minister to you. And I'm going to sit on the front row and, and say amen because the preacher was on point. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'm suffering some vocal fatigue, so we're going to do a little bit of a hybrid today. But um, how many of you have enjoyed our series, Psalms of the Summer? You've been taking this in and really live in the Psalms. Let me encourage you. Next week we start a new series, Great Expectations. Don't miss it. But let me encourage you to live in the Psalms. Every season of your life you're going to find in the Psalms. Every prayer you need to pray, you'll find in the Psalms. Every moment of life where you need to tap into God is expressed in this phenomenal collection of songs. And today we're going to look for a moment at the, the final psalm, Psalm 150, and then we'll transition the message and we're going to study Psalm 18. So you get a, a twofer today. But Psalm 150 is really the consummation of the book and it declares that we are to praise God. Listen. Bottom line, your God is worthy of all of your praise in every season of your life just because of who he is and what he's done. Does anybody believe that today? He's worthy of all praise. Now, in the Bible, there are seven Hebrew words for praise, all right? And each has a unique meaning. Some means to throw out the hands and give thanks. Others to bow and to bless. And then the word that you'll find most frequently in the Psalms is this Hebrew word right here. It's halal. Can we say that together, all locations? Halal, which is the root word of what? Hallelujah. Did you know that hallelujah is only found in the book of Revelation in your Bible? It's actually a song that's sung in eternity, and it's the song of heaven. So when you sing the hallelujahs, you're actually tapping into an eternal song. And Hebrew is halal ye, ya, and halal, halal means this. This is a unique translation. You know, the Hebrew language has such depth and beauty and meaning and poetry that it takes a lot of English words to stack up and talk about it, all right? So here's what it means in English. To shine, to make a show, to boast, to rave, to be clamorously foolish, to celebrate. Okay, take a look at that. You get it? We're going to shine, show, boast, rave. How many of you guys been to a rave? Good confession on a Sunday morning. All right. Clamorously foolish. Listen, heaven is not a quiet or reserved place. Biblical worship is not quiet and reserved. That's religion. Religion says, shh, don't disturb people. That, that's not biblical praise. Biblical praise is loud, it's active, it's not based on denominational preference, it's not based on age demographic, it's not based on your personality type or what kind of style you like. It's based on who God is and the fact that he wants us to make some noise, all right? So in just a minute, we're going to do that together. Now, in Psalm 150, everywhere you see the word praise, you'll find that it is this Hebrew word halal. So as we're going to read it in a moment, but as we praise the Lord, we praise God in the sanctuary, we praise Him in the mighty heavens, the Bible's saying, rave, make a show, boast, reflect, be clamorously foolish before Yah. Now, this is not just to get you guys hyped up on a weekend service, because praise is more than an activity, it's actually your road to victory. So I want you to get on that road to victory. And when you're facing the darkest storms of your life, to be able to lift your hands, lift your voice, lift your soul to God and declare who he is. Amen? So you guys ready? We're, gonna, we're actually going to do this for a couple minutes before we go into the remainder of the sermon. This is the interactive portion of your message today. So at all locations, would you guys stand to your feet? And we're going to read out Psalm 150 with some passion. Anybody got any passion in God's house today? All right. We're going to read it with some passion, and then we're actually going to model it together. It's going to be a great time. Shall we read? Let's do it. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. 
Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the blast of a ram's horn. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel, drum, and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and flutes. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with the loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Come on, praise the Lord. Woo! I want you to sing this little line with Pastor Joseph right here. You ready? I will praise. one time. All right. Come on, somebody. Have a seat. Let's hear the word of the Lord today. Hey, God is worthy of praise no matter what, because there's some themes. There's a theme that runs through all the Psalms we've studied, and here's what it is. Your life is not always a, a hallelujah day. Life is filled with trouble and heartache and tragedy and unexpected events that blindside you. But we learn from the songwriters, the psalmists, that no matter what happens, it's always in order to bless the Lord. As David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And the Hebrew word there, it can be translated praise in your Bible. It actually means to kneel and to throw up the hands in adoration. He said, no matter what season of my life, I'll bow before Yahweh, and I will throw up my hands in adoration and thanksgiving. 
I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. So we see this theme that when we worship God in all seasons, then God. Then God comes through and he rescues and restores and delivers and does only what God can do. So there's a thread throughout the Psalms because praise is not just an activity in your life. It is, in fact, your road to victory. Now, in all movies and screenwriting, there's a, a narrative arc. You've probably heard about the narrative arc, which means uh, there's acts in any, any film, any uh, script, right? And it usually starts with an introduction. You kind of meet the characters and the scenarios begin to build, and that is act one. And then in act two, that's when the dilemma takes place, enter the hero, and things look bleak and horrible. Usually the villain's doing really well during the middle act, right, during the middle scene, and our hero's in trouble. And then there's a resolution to it and a conclusion. So in every uh, writing arc, we'll find this in the Psalms, you have the setup, you have the dilemma, and you have the resolve. The setup, the dilemma, and the resolve. And I don't know about you, but don't you think that good movies always end with a hero winning? Does anybody agree? Now, track with me on this. Do you get frustrated if you go to a movie and they drag you in emotionally and then they kill the good guy at the end? You ever seen a movie like that? Not a fan whatsoever. Or you're all emotionally tangled in this thing and all of a sudden they roll credits. There's no resolve. How many just want to curse at the screen? I'm sorry, you're in church, don't raise your hand. Man. All the unsanctified ones, you're like, oh, you're right, I do. Yeah, because the good movies end with a good ending. There's a resolve, right? The hero wins. The couple gets back together. The guy gets the girl. The villain dies. Is anybody with me? Nobody wants to see Jack sink to the bottom of the Atlantic while Rose floats away on an oversized plank where clearly there was room for one more passenger. Nobody, nobody likes that ending, right? Is that just me? And so there, there's a, a storyline, and we're going to take a look at the arc of Psalm 18. And I, I believe in the next few minutes that God is going to speak to some people tonight. And David, I'll set it up for you, then we'll read. Uh, David had just been delivered uh, from a decade of persecution and being on the run and being a victim. And then God turns it around because of his heart of worship and his life of worship. So there's three acts in Psalm 18. Here's what they are. First, David is the victim. And then David is in training. And then David steps up into victory. So we'll start out in Act 1. And by the way, Psalm 18 is the fourth longest psalm, so we won't read it all. I'll just take you to kind of the meat, the heart of these three acts. First, we find David crying out as the victim. And here's what he says. Verse 4 through 6. The ropes of death entangled me. Floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path. But in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I prayed to, the, to my God for help. He heard me from his sanctuary. My cry to him reached his ears. So David is painting this picture as he recalls this decade of pain and suffering. In the prime of his life, he'd become the victim of a rage-filled, wicked king. I mean, he was literally and physically attacked by his boss and spiritual leader. Now, some of you have been verbally attacked by your boss or verbally attacked by a spiritual leader, and, and you've been the victim of that, and that leaves a mark. But let's just say you work, you know, at the grocery store, and you're, you're over the produce department, and you stack up the heads of lettuce, and they all crumble out and fall in the aisle, and you get called in the office by the boss. Now, you might be prepared for a bit of a, a verbal lashing for messing up the lettuce heads, but wouldn't you be surprised if you walked in and he's holding a spear? And his first response to your lettuce mess was, you know, that's what, that's what David went through. There was an attack on his life. In fact, he was attacked with intent to kill. He was ran out of his home. He was exiled from his friends and his family. He was hunted by an army. He lived for a decade as a wanted man when all he was doing what was right in the eyes of God. Now, David's level of victimization is far beyond what most of us in this room have experienced. And as I talk about being a victim, in fact, tonight, if you need a title for this message, here's my title, From Victim to Victor. From Victim to Victor. 
Now, I understand that there's been some people here and at all the locations that are watched this weekend, and you've been the victim of several levels of abuse, maybe verbal, perhaps physical, sexual, different things that have left a mark and a scar, and I probably can't relate to a lot of your suffering and what you've gone through, but you know, I've walked through some things in my life and existence that uh, it only surprises me that I came through them, but by the grace of God, amen? So we've all suffered, because here's, here's what a victim actually is, I'll give you a definition of it. It's a person who undeservedly suffers something destructive because the actions of another, okay? Anybody in the room here, we've all been here, undeservedly suffering something destructive because the actions of another. So maybe you got bullied in the third grade. Maybe you're on the ugly end of a divorce and someone had an affair uh, outside of marriage and you were the victim of that heartbreak, You know, maybe you went to a church and there was spiritual abuse and whatever your victimization is, we've all experienced being hacked and attacked. It happens in life. But the question then is not whether or not we've been victimized, but this, will we live as a victim? It's one thing to go through some things in your life. It's another thing to settle in that place for the rest of your days. It cost David a decade. If anybody could have sat down and said, I've had it, God's not faithful. His promise has not come true. I'm out. David had a justifiable reason to do so. But we're going to learn something from his life tonight in just a few verses here. Because the difference between a defeated, low living existence versus a faith-filled, overcoming life is the answer to this question right here. Lean in. What will you do with what life has done to you? What will you do with what life has done to you? The answer to that question will determine whether or not you live as a victim or as a victor. Now, some, there's probably some people in the room, I think we all suffer from a level of this, and that is victim mentality. Don't lift your hand, but do you have a friend or a relative that they are fully wrapped up with a victim mentality? You probably know somebody like that. But I think we all struggle with it because it's much easier to blame someone else or everyone else for my failures and faults and where I'm stuck in life than to deal with it, get over it, and move on. It's quiet up in here, Napa. Quiet up in here in Vacaville. Right? Now, I just want to help you tonight to get free because God has not called and designed you to live as a victim. No matter what you've been through, there is a place of victory, and you can go from victim to victor if we'll just follow the simple recipe in the three acts of Psalm 18. Now, you're probably living with a victim mentality if. You ready? Number one, your conversations always revert back to what they did to you. If you're quick to blame others and not take responsibility for your failure. Or how about if you truly believe that where you are in life is the result of what's been done to you. If you don't trust people and you believe they'll hurt you if you trust again, you might have a victim mentality. Or if you often feel like someone else gets the breaks, the promotion, or the credit that you deserve, you might have a victim mentality. If you relive scenarios of how things could have been different if they had not done it to you, or If you're quite proficient in finding ways to deny responsibility for your actions and circumstances, one more, if your conversations lean heavy in the direction of what happened in the past versus what's up ahead in the future, you might have a victim mentality. And people get paralyzed. Listen, you can get paralyzed because of that divorce. You can get paralyzed over that church split. You can get paralyzed over that sexual abuse and never move on until you learn how to lean upon the rock, find the shelter of the Lord Jesus Christ, and develop a vocabulary of praise. Because remember, praise is not just an activity. It is, in fact, your road to victory. Here's a quote for you. Victim mentality lives in the past while victor mentality leans into the future. It doesn't matter what you've been through. There is a hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11, he still has a good plan for you. He's still got a plan to prosper you and to bring you out in Jesus' name, no matter how deep you've been. Come on, somebody. So David, um, he does six things, okay? And I just want to give you some direct quotes from this portion of Scripture because this is where things will shift in your life. Here's what we find as David moves into act two. He says, in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. You'll find this in the verbiage of David. He's always running to the shelter. 
He's always declaring God is my rock, my refuge, my only fortress. What is your default mechanism? When you get the bad news, when the relation blows up, when the medication doesn't work, when the diagnosis goes sideways, what is your default? David's default was this. He cried out to the Lord. So he did that one. The next thing that David did is he prayed to my God for help. I prayed to my God for help. This is a lifestyle. You know it takes a humble person to live a lifestyle of prayer. Because most of us will go this way. Things are going great. I don't pray much. Life blows up. Oh, God, it's Dave. Nine, five, six, eight, seven, seven, seven. <laughs> South Vacaville. Right? Life's good again. My prayer life, whoo. But to consistently seek the Lord, it requires a right perspective of the awesome power of a living God and a humility to continue to come before him. And David carried that in his life. Then he said, I've kept the ways of the Lord. So he was consistent. He was steadfast, even during the years of victimization. Then he says, I have not turned from my God to follow evil. Now listen, the toughest time and point of temptation in your life is here. When you're in a season you don't understand, when you're the victim, you've cried out to God and he's gone sheepishly quiet. It seems like omnipotent, sovereign child abuse to you, but you don't know who to turn him into. It's, it's like, God, this is not just, this is not right. I prayed for three months, you've done nothing. And that is when most people, without a foundation and roots going deep, they will tap out and say, that Christian thing did not work for me. But David made a declaration, I have not turned from my God to follow evil. And then he said this, I have never abandoned his decrees. What are his decrees? It's his law. D don't underestimate the power of you staying in the word. On the good days and the bad days, get a reading program, get a Bible app, listen to the word of God, study the word of God. Why? Because it will be a, a lamp under your feet and a light under your path. It'll be a foundation. And like Jesus, when he was attacked in the wilderness, he quotes the book of Deuteronomy and he rebukes the enemy, he says, it is written. So you got to stay in the word and do not abandon the decrees. I'm talking to somebody who's in the victim mode right now. I'm talking to somebody who's in that valley and you don't understand. Understand, there are some keys that you can use that will bring you out and you will go from victim to victor in Jesus' name. Then one more. He said, he is my shield, the power that saves me. So David continued to be a worshiper. Now, as he's doing this, we move from act one, a victim and 10 years on the run, a broken man, now to something that God was doing in his life during those quiet years, and it's this, God was training him to be an overcomer. Listen, there's a training going on. If you're doing your best for God, if you're simply obeying his call in your life and everything has gone horribly wrong, you might just be in training for greatness. You might just be in a season where God is preparing you for more than you can ever ask or think if you will stay with it. Come on, has anybody got any Holy Spirit resilience in their heart tonight? Now, I, I wanna read you what happens in Act 2 of this psalm. Here's what it is. He says, God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. He's a shield for all who look to him for protection. For who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock? These are rhetorical questions, correct? So the answer is, ain't nobody. Ain't nobody but God. Ain't no solid rock but God. Then he says this, God arms me with strength and he makes my way perfect. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, enabling me to stand on the mountain heights. Lean in. This all happens during the victim years. This all happens during the waiting in the cave. This all happens as he does those six things we're talking about. He goes on to say, he trains my hands for battle and he strengthens my arms to bend a bow of bronze. Say what? I mean, back in the day, they didn't actually hunt with bronze bows. They were wooden bows and those are hard to stretch back. So this is a, it's a poetic metaphor. I don't know if there's a miraculous moment when David actually bent a bow of bronze. What he's saying in this statement is, God prepares me to do something so supernatural that I could never do it in my own strength. 
There is some training going on in the quiet, lonely years if you will stand upon the rock Christ Jesus, confess who he is, be true to his decrees, declare that God is faithful, and stay put in the house of God. He is training your arms to bend a bow of bronze. He's preparing you for a battle now that you haven't seen yet. The training happens when no one's watching. The training happens when all hell is breaking loose in your life and you have the right, based on everybody's opinion around you, you have the right to say, it doesn't work, I'm quitting church, I'm out of here. But blessed are those who meditate upon the law of God day and night because that law will get so implanted in your spirit that in the end of the day, when it's all falling apart, you're going to say this, where can I go, God? Whom have I in heaven but you? There is no one like you. Where else can we go, Lord? You alone have the words of eternal life, and you will find yourself standing put in the house of God, and their training begins to take place. I'm telling you, he's preparing you for something great that you haven't seen yet. And it only happens. The supernatural, listen, the supernatural you long for in your life only happens after he trains your hands for battle. So in these early acts, let me just refresh your memory before we close out, and I'll call the band up in a minute. But God meets you in the middle of your trial, all right? Number one. You cry out and say, God, I have no help. I need you. Deliver me from this addiction. Deliver me from this depression. And he comes and he rescues and he saves you. But while you're still in the mess, he begins to train you on how to fight your way out so that you will never be susceptible to that battle again. Listen, God wants to train you to live in sustainable victory. It's not a high, low, your life scale should not look like this. You should go from glory to glory, faith to faith. God trains you for sustainable victory. But then the third thing, he trains you for future battles. And here's the big idea. Your training is bigger than you. L let me give you some application of this. In this building, we just cut the ribbon on. There's so much ministry that's going to go on. And part of that ministry is uh, intimate encounters, marriage ministry. And we have marriage mentoring and marriage recovery groups and divorce recovery groups and all kinds of great groups led by Pastor Tim Nally in our small group ministry. But listen, listen, listen. I, I've had a chance to talk to many of those that lead and counsel in the marriage ministry. And you know what? Some of them have been through a divorce. Some of them two divorces. Most of them have been through some rough water in their marriage. Water so rough that they didn't think they would make it. But by the grace of God, they cried out to the rock and the refuge. He rescued them, set their feet upon a rock, trained them so that they could sustain their love and their marriage, and then turned around and said, now I'm going to use you to minister and bend a bow of bronze so you can take out the enemy. Come on, somebody. Another thing that's going to happen in that building every Monday night is celebrate recovery. And our leaders in Celebrate Recovery is Bill and Josie here. They were here for the dedication. Are you here, Bill? He went home. Oh, that's too bad. No, he'll be here tomorrow, but he was here for the, I just saw him earlier. But Bill and Josie and Phil and Charlotte and all those who lead Celebrate Recovery every Monday night. So listen what happened to these guys. There was a moment in their life when they were addicted to cocaine or meth or alcohol or anger or pornography, and they cried out to the rock and said, rescue me, and God lifted them up and set them free and trained them to live in sustainable victory. But the victory was not just for themselves. Now they stand up every Monday night, and they gather a group of people, and they say, I can help you bend a bow of bronze. I can help you get free because I have freedom training. On and on. I'll just tell you, you guys know some of my story. I've pastored this church 20 years now, much of it through prolonged seasons of depression and anxiety and couldn't seem to get free from it. I thought, God, I, I would leave church a lot of Sundays thinking how I could quit and leave Vacaville and none of you know it or figured out. And I was, it was perplexed by this math equation that didn't make any sense. But I found something out. That if I would stand strong in my moment of weakness, in my valley of depression, and declare the faithfulness of God, actually in those dark days, he was training my arms to bend a bow of bronze. He was training me not just to sustain victory in my life. Listen, I have sustained victory. 
The joy of the Lord is my strength. Depression has been broken off my life. I'm no longer anxious or depressed or worried about quitting ministry. I'm alive in Jesus. I'm doing good. I'm enjoying the journey. But he didn't train me just so I can stand up here and yell in a microphone. He trained my arms so that, listen, 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 I can train you. I can actually teach you how to stay in your Christian walk for the long haul. I, I can teach you how to love God when people hurt you and betray you and walk away from you and say horrible things about you. I can teach you how to get a smile on your face and lift your hands. Why? Because I've been trained for victory, to stand in a platform of victory and to lead God's people into triumph. So listen, we don't serve God from a platform of victimization. I'm not living in the past, oh, woe is me. Let me tell you my story, what they did to me at the last church. Sit down, the next two hours are gonna be a little dry, right? No, we don't live from a platform of victimization. And I am compassionate and aware that some of you are hurting today and you've just been through the divorce or the bankruptcy or the church split, but I know my God and I know what he says about your future, and it's this, I will train your hands to war. When no one thinks you're coming out of the cave, I have a purpose and a plan, and I will use everything the enemy meant for evil, and he's gonna turn it for good. Come on. Anybody remember Joseph had a dream about his life, shared it with his brothers? punched in the face, thrown in a ditch, left for dead, thrown into prison, forgot about in prison. And when he finally comes out years later, God gathers his family back around him, restores everything he lost, and made him the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. And he looks his brothers in the face and he says, the very thing you meant for evil, my God turned it for good. That's how your God operates. That's what David is singing about. So what's happening in your life? Because God is training your hands now for a bow you're gonna bend in the future. Let's have the band come and here's act three. Just take a minute on this one. He says, you've given me your shield of victory. Your right hand supports me. Your help has made me great. You've made, you have made a wide path for my feet to keep them from slipping. Some of you need that tonight. I chased my enemies and caught them. I did not stop until they were conquered. Read the whole Psalm, because he's like, I just beat them down until they couldn't get up. It gets a little graphic, but you'll enjoy it. <laughs> the Lord lives. Praise to my rock. May the God of my salvation be exalted. So what did God do? He took them from victim, act one, into training. And those six elements that marked his life, act two. And then he set him up to live and to walk in victory. That's what God wants to do in your life. Before I pray for you, let me just return to this question and just let this sit on your heart for just a moment. This declaration, this statement, what you do with what's been done to you is what writes your story. Let me say it again. What you do with what's been done to you is what writes your story. And tonight, if you are a victim and you're living with that mindset, Jesus wants to set you free. He wants to put a new song in your mouth and he wants you to realize that I'm in training for greatness. If I'll respond to him, he will make my arms so strong I can move into the supernatural in the future. You don't have to live as a victim. You don't have to stay in the cave. You can run to God, amen? I believe in this room. There are mighty men and women of God who are in training. I believe there are mighty men and women. They're gonna bend a bow of bronze. They're gonna do something supernatural in the future. And this is the narrative arc throughout the Psalms. God says, I will take you, I will lift you up. Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he leaned down and climbed his ear and he heard me. And he lifted me up out of the miry clay, out of a pit. And he set my feet upon a rock. And he established my way. And he's put a new song in my mouth, even a song of praise to our God. Many will hear it, and they will fear, and they will put their trust in the Lord. From the pit 
to the rock to influence. That's where God's taken you. He wants to take you from victim to victor in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's bow our heads. Napa, God bless you guys. Come on, let's bow our heads in this room. I hope the Holy Spirit is speaking to you directly. And let's just honor the presence of God for this final couple minutes here. Both in this room, still connected to the live stream and in the family rooms. Let me ask you this question. What's the Holy Spirit speaking to you today? You might be here and you're carrying a victim mentality from a hurt, a wound from a year ago or a decade ago. You might be still blaming that divorce or whatever it was or that thing that happened, bad church experience. And today God has freedom for you. There's freedom. In just a couple of minutes, leaders are gonna come to the front. We're gonna pray for everyone who needs prayer. And if, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about that victim mentality or recovering from a hurt, there's a place of healing today. There's a turnaround for your life. So let's respond to him. Let's respond to the Holy Spirit. He's in this room right now and he's speaking directly to hearts. So let's be responsive and let him heal us, amen? With your heads bowed, if you're here today and you would say, you know what, Pastor Dave, I, I come to church today, but I gotta say, I'm not right with Jesus. I got distance between me and God. I, I've got sin in my life and I know I need forgiveness. I need a savior. Maybe you're here and you're not walking with God. You're not living for God. I want to give you an invitation. It's just between you and the Lord. I'll agree with you. We definitely won't put anybody on the spot, but I want it to be a clear moment of demarcation. If you've been away from God for a while or if you've never fully committed your life to Christ. But today, the Holy Spirit is saying, Son, come home. Daughter, today's your day. I'm drawing you. Word clearly tells us that if we will believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that salvation takes place. So if that's you and God is speaking to you, would you do something um, just boldly right now in this moment. Would you look up and wave at me? Say, Pastor Dave, that's me. God's speaking. I'm coming home today. Thanks for waving. Way in the top, sir. In the white shirt. God bless you, mate. And here and here. Over here, bro. God bless you. Right over here. Thank you, man. All over the room right here in the tank top, this couple, this lady here. God bless you right here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Just with your heads bowed, gentleman over there in the darker shirt sitting on the floor, just a word for you. Lord says he's been dealing with your heart for quite some time, and you, you've resisted him to a degree, but you know there's a call in your life to be a leader, and you feared what would happen if you said yes to God. And the Lord says today, son, I have you covered and you will stand in a place of leadership, but I'm gonna take you one step at a time. And the very things that you feared in surrendering to me, that will be the most, the platform, the greatest joy of your life. And, and bro, God has so much for you. Today's a big day for you, but God has so much for you in the future. If you're in the family corner today, you can lift your hand, there's leaders over there. And I actually wanna appeal to anybody who's sitting on their couch, if you're, at home, another state, or deployed, whatever, but I just feel like God's reaching out to people that are not in this room, and as we pray a prayer in just a moment, would you join us and say, Jesus, be Lord of my life, and make a difference in your eternity. With everybody that's lifted their hand, there's still hands going up, I, I want to pray a declaration today. It's just a launching point. It's a starting point for you in your faith. I'd like everybody to repeat this after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, today's my day and I'm coming home. I thank you for your grace. Thank you for forgiveness. I receive it today. Be my Savior and Lord, and by your grace, I'm gonna follow you all my days until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's just thank the Lord.